Hey guys, it's uh, Kelly and Bentley, and I'm going to read chapter two of uh, Sue Grafton's ex. Approaching Hallie Benacourt's property that night, I realized I'd caught a glance of the house from the freeway on numerous occasions. It was perched on a ridge that ran between the town and the outer reaches of the Los Padros National Forest. By day, the sun reflected off the glass interior, winking like an SO SOS. At night, the glow was a bright spot, as vivid as Venus, against the pale light of surrounding stars. Um, from a distance, it was one of those areas that seemed impossible to reach, isolated from its neighbor, neighbors at an elevation sufficient to encourage nosebleeds. The access roads weren't obvious, and without Haley's instructions, I'm not sure I would have found my way. She indicated the easiest route was to follow 192 East as far as Winding Canyon Road, and then start the ascent. I did as she, she suggested, taking the narrow two-lane road, two road that snaked up the hill with more switchbacks than straightaways. A mile and a half farther on, I spotted the house number blasted onto the surface of a massive sandstone boulder. There was a mailbox nearby, which also touted the address, but the house itself wasn't visible from the road. The driveway angled upward through a thicket of oaks, a precipitous approach, that ran for another quarter of a mile. When I neared the crest of the hill, the house loomed above me like an apparition. If an alien spacecraft had landed, I imagine it would have had the same nearly menacing presence. Against the shadowy landscape, the stark structure blazed with light, the contemporary style oddly suited to the rugged terrain. The front jutted forward like the prow of a ship and appeared to hang out over the canyon, a sailboat made of glass. Vegetation broke in waves, churning among the concrete pilings, and the wind blew with a high whine. A parking pad had been hacked out of the stony ground. I pulled in, nosing my Honda up against a stone retaining wall. I got out and locked the car. As I walked, I triggered a, ser I triggered a series of motion-activated uh, landscape lights that illuminated the path in front of me. I climbed the ste steep stones to, stones to the door, careful where I placed my feet, lest least I topple into the chaparral that stretched out on either side. From the front porch, as I faced the glass front door, I had an unobstructed view straight through the house to the dark beyond. The Pacific was visible two miles away, where moonlight cast a gray sheen on the water like a thin layer of ice. The ribbon of Highway 101 wound between the shoreline and the town, and a lacework of house lights was draped across the intervening hills. Large patches of darkness attested to the rural character of the area. There were no neighbors close by, and the simplest of daily needs, such as wine and toilet paper, <laughs> sounds familiar now, right? Would uh, require a lengthy drive into town. I rang the bell and saw Hallie appear on the wraparound deck on the far side of the house. She entered the dining room by way of a sliding glass door, a caftan of butter yellow, butter yellow sick billing around, billowing around her as she crossed the room. She had a tangled mass of brownish, reddish brown hair and a face photographers must have loved. While she wasn't technically beautiful, she was striking, fine boned, high forehead. Her complexion was flawless and her narrow nose was prominent with a bump at the bridge that lent her profile an exotic cast. Her ears were pierced and a little waterfall diamonds dangled on either side of her face. The caftan had wide sleeves and intricate embroidery along the cuffs. Only a woman who's genuinely slim can afford a garment as voluminous. voluminous. Pointed yellow velvet slippers peeked from beneath her hem. I placed her in her mid-forties. She opened the door and extended her hand. Hello, Kinsey. I'm Hallie. Thanks for making the drive. I apologize for the imposition. Nice to meet you, I said. This is quite a place. She flushed with pl pleasure, saying, isn't it? She led the way, and I followed as she moved through the house toward the deck. Much of the interior was shrouded in darkness. The furniture was covered with tarps in preparation for her departure. When I glanced to my left, I could see that the doors leading off the hallway were closed. On the wide stretch of wood flooring, I could see islands of lush-looking oriental carpeting. Lamps glowed here and there, lighting up decorative vignettes of tasteful objects artfully arranged. I just want you to see Bentley a little more. He's the best thing to look at. Right, Bentley? Um, uh, where was I? Artfully arranged.
changed. Um, to our right, a two-story wood and glass living room took up one whole end of the house. Um, it was blanketed in shadow, but a spill of light from the dining room reflected clean lines against the genuous expanses of exterior glass. Bare, wall, bare white walls formed a gallery for numerous paintings and heavy gold frames. I'm not a connoisseur of art, but um, they did appear to be museum quality works, landscapes and still life images in oil. Um, and my impression was that a lot of money had been spent on this collection. Over her sho shoulder, Hallie said, I hope you won't be cold if we sit outside. I've been enjoying the view. My husband left this morning for the house in Malibu while I close up here. Must be nice to split your time that way, I said. Personally, I split, split mine between my 800 square foot apartment and an office half that size. We went out onto the deck. Exterior lights had been extinguished and in the lee of the house, the air seemed hushed. I could smell bay laurel, eucalyptus, um, and night blooming jasmine. On a terrace below, a bright turquoise infinity pool glowed like a landing strip. An open bottle of Chardonnay sat on a small wooden table flanked by two canvas director's chairs. She brought out two stem glasses and I saw that hers was half full. She took the closest chair and I settled in its mate. She offered wine, which I declined as a way of demonstrating how professional I was. And to be honest, with the slightest encouragement, bracing outside temperatures aside, I'd have lingered there for hours, drinking in the view along with anything else she had to offer. We were flanked by two small propane heaters that radiated a fierce but diffused heat that made me want to hold my hands closer as though to a campfire. Santa Teresa is almost always chilly after sunset. And once I sat down, I found myself wedging my fingers between my knees. Uh, it's cold here right now too, weirdly. Um, I was wearing blue jeans and boots with a black turtleneck, turtleneck under my good wool tweed blazer. So I was warm enough, but I wondered how she could bear the night in such flimsy attire, especially with the wind whistling around the edges of the glass. Locks of flyaway hair danced around her face. She removed two hairpins that she held between her teeth while she captured the loose strands and secured them again. How long have you owned the house? I asked. Um, I grew up here. This is the old Clipper estate. My father bought it in the early 30s, shortly after he graduated from architectural school. Um, Halston Betancourt, you may have heard of him. I made a sound as though, though of recognition, though I didn't have a clue. After he raised the original three-story Georgian-style mansion, he built this, which is how he launched his career. He was always proud of the fact that he was featured in Architectural Digest, more than any other single architect. He's been gone for two years now, and my mother as well. The place in Malibu belongs to my husband, Jeff. He's a G-E-O-F-F -F Jeff, not the J-E-F-F -F kind. We've been married for two years. What sort of work does he do? Well, he has a law degree, but he doesn't have a job as such. He manages both of our portfolios and looks after our finances. Fragmented as it was, I had no idea where her commentary was taking us, but I was making mental notes. I couldn't help but wonder how the neighbors felt when her father demolished the old estate and erected this in its place. The house was dramatic, but distinctly short of 18th century charm. From her remarks, I drew the two obvious inferences. She'd retained her maiden name, and she'd held on to the family home. I could imagine her insisting that G-E-O-F-F -F Jeffrey sign an ironclad prenuptial agreement, separate properties, separate bank accounts, a cheater's clause, and zero spousal support in the event of a split. On the other hand, his fortune might have been more substantial than hers, in which case any stingy financial arrangement might have been his idea. She crossed her legs and smoothed the yellow silk over one knee, pleading the fabric. I should tell you again how much I appreciate your agreeing to meet like this. Under the circumstances, it's a relief you're doing business. It's a relief doing business with a woman. No disrespect to men intended, but some things a woman un understands intuitively. From the heart, you might say. I'm zipping up, I'm just cold. Ooh. Now is thinking about the big gambling debts or an affair with a married man. Uh-oh, it was impossible. It, it was also possible her new husband had an unsavory past and she'd just gotten wind of it. She reached out and picked up a file folder that rested against the side of her chair. She opened the folder, removed a paper clip, and then passed the loose pages to me um, along with the pen light to make reading easier. I was looking at a photograph of a newspaper article. I checked the date and heading, the Santa Teresa Dish Dispatch. June 21st, 1979. A 
approximately 10 years earlier. The article covered the trial of a kid named Christian Saderfield, a safe cracker who'd finally been defeated by a run of cutting edge vaults and had thrown that career over in favor of robbing banks, um, which was a much simpler proposition much simpler proposition. Um, robbing banks entailed pithy notes directed to bank tellers, no weapons, and no mechanical skills. The work was quicker too. Um, he enjoyed a string of successes, but eventually his luck had run out. He'd been convicted of robbing 19 banks in the Tri-County area. 19 banks. That is a lot, isn't it, Bentley? Bentley's watching the squirrels, by the way. <laughs> um... All right, so 19 banks. Um, the photograph that accompanied, that accompanied the story revealed a clean-cut young man with good facial bones and an open countenance. The three-column coverage on the front page continued for an additional four columns on page four, laying out the reasoning for his choice of banks. Um, his meticulous advanced planning and carefully worded notes he composed. I could picture him licking his pencil point, trying to get the written threats just so, all the spelling and no cross-outs. I scanned the lines of print, picking up a detail here and there. His successes had netted him close to $134,000 over a period of 16 months. Just moving a little, Oof. okay. Um, just had to readjust. Bentley wants to readjust too, so I want him to be in the picture. Um, so over in his demands, he claimed to be armed and while he never actually brandished a gun, um, the tellers were sufficiently, sufficiently intimidated to surrender the cash without an argument. Though this was standard bank policy, three of the young women were so traumatized they had never returned to work. Hallie waited until I finished reading and handed me a folder, me a folded newspaper with an arrow calling my attention to a notice dated six months before. Satterfield had been released, having served a little over eight years, which I was guessing represented 85% of a 10 year bid. As you can see, he was reached from Lumpoc to a halfway house in the San Fernando Valley. Since he was a Santa Teresa resident when he was arrested and tried, I'm told he's most likely been returned to the community by now. I wondered if you could get me his current contact information. I called the... Hello. Hello. <laughs> I love you. This is Bear, by the way. I called the county probation twice and got nowhere. Her manner of speaking had become more formal, suggesting she was ill at ease. The United States Penitentiary at Lombok is a federal prison located an hour north of us. The facility opened in 1959 and houses male inmates serving long sent sentences for sophisticated offenses, white collar crime, interstate drug, drug deals, tax evasion, and major fraud. As a bank robber, Satterfield must have felt right at home. I wondered about the nature of her interest in him. To me, the two seemed an odd mix. I said he would have been a release. He would have been. He wouldn't have been released by the county. His crime was federal. You'd have to call the U.S. Probation Department and ask for the name of the agent supervising his parole. She frowned. I'm not happy with that idea. I don't know the system, and I'd only end up in another dead end. The whole process has been frustrating enough as it is, and I leave town early tomorrow. We'll be in Malibu for, for a few days, and after that, we'll be traveling. I'd prefer to have you deal with the situation. As you might well imagine, I have no experience with matters of this sort. I'll do what I can, but I make no guarantees, I said. Parole officers are nor notoriously tight-lipped. All the more reason for you to handle it, I said. I assumed your inquiry will be discreet. Oh, of course, I said. Good, she said. Once you have his address and phone number, you can send me a note in care of my post office box. My assistant will know where we are and she'll be forwarding mail twice a week. May I ask what this is about? She paused, her gaze not quite meeting mine. He's my son. She paused again. Intuitively and from the heart, I hadn't seen that one coming and I was taken aback. And I said, ah. I became pregnant and bore a child when I was 15 years old. If the choice had been mine, I'd have kept the baby and raised him myself. But my parents were adamant. They felt I was too young and too mature to take on such a burden, a point I could hardly refute. They were convinced he'd be better off in a two-parent home. Given his criminal history, they were obviously wrong, mistaken in that regard. Does he know where you are? 
Does he know who you are? Her cheeks tinted slightly. He does. Some years ago, I wrote him a letter in care of the adoption agency, and the social worker said she'd keep it in his file. I wanted to make sure he'd have a way to reach me if he were ever interested. And did you hear from him? I did. He called shortly after his 18th birthday. We met twice, twice, and then I lost track of him. When I saw the brief note about his release from Lumpac, his silence suddenly made sense. That's when I went back and did a follow-up search in the archives at the dispatch. I glanced at the article. You first learned be, he was in prison when you saw this? That's correct. I, didn't, I don't ordinarily read the dispatch, but I spotted a copy as I was leaving my dentist's office. When I caught sight of the name, I'm so, excuse me, I was so shocked. I just sit down for a moment and catch my breath. I was also deeply ashamed, as though the fault were mine. I took my time deciding what I wanted to do. And what would that be? I'd like to help him if he needs anything, if there's anything he needs. That's generous of you. Well, it's not about generosity. It's about making amends. Does he know you're well off? Does he know how well off you are? Her expression became set. What difference does that make? Well, you're not worried he might try to take advantage? If we were going to do that, he'd have done so years ago. I've never made a secret of my financial position. I offered him money in the past and he declined. What if he's embarrassed about his felony conviction and doesn't want to hear from you? If he decides not to talk to me, then so be it. But I want him to have the opportunity. I feel a sense of responsibility. She picked up the wine bottle to top off her glass and the label caught my eye. I'd seen the same Chardonnay at a liquor store for 90 bucks a pop. Well, I didn't actually gasp aloud. She must have deciphered my luck and held it the bottle. bottle. Perhaps you will allow me to talk you into a glass? Maybe half a glass, I said. I watched her pour, taking advantage of the moment to assess her situation. What about your husband? Where is he on this? Jeffrey knows I had a child and put him up for adoption. All of this happened years before the two of us met. What he doesn't know is that we've reconnected, and he certainly doesn't know about Christian serving a prison sentence. Um, 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 sorry, where was I? Um, I can see where it might be an awkward revelation to spring on him after the fact. On the other hand, if my son doesn't care to pursue a relationship, why mention it at all? Once you fess up, you're stuck. Jeffrey hates deception, and he's really slow to forgive. There's no point in creating trouble unnecessarily. Indeed, I said, without even meaning to. I was echoing, echoing the tone and the manager, manner of her speech. <laughs> That's why I'm asking you to act as a go-between, using your name and phone number instead of mine. I don't want to risk my husband's in intercepting a message before I've told him the whole of it. You don't want your name brought in into it at all, I ask? I do not. What reason would I give for tracking him down? I've never even met Christian Saderfield. I'm sure you'll think of some excuse. The point is, I want my privacy, re privacy respected. I'll insist on that wondering if this was really the way a good marriage worked if I'd been married and I'd been married and divorced twice so it was difficult to judge keeping secrets seemed like a bad idea but I was hardly qualified to offer the woman mar marital advice aside from that I've never had children so the notion of a bank robber for a son was tough to assimilate his stepdad might take an even dimmer view of it reluctantly I said I'm not sure a par parole officer will give me the information but I'll do what I can I studied the black and white newspaper photograph, and then I held up the photocopied pages. May I keep these? Might be good if I need to identify him on sight. She reached into the file folder a second time and handed me duplicates. I murmured a thank you and slid the papers into the outside pocket of my shoulder bag. So how do we proceed, she asked. Well, most new clients sign a boilerplate contract, I said, over the years. I found it's better to have an agreement in writing, as much for your protection as for, my, protection as for mine. There's, that way, there's no confusion about I've been asked, what I've been asked to do. In this case, I didn't bring any paperwork. I wanted to make sure I could be of help before I did anything else. Sensible, she said. As I see it, we can do one of two things. You can write up the contract, fill in particulars, and mail it for my signature, or we consider this a gentleman's agreement and I can pay you in cash. There wasn't really much to debate, to debate. I'm not equipped to take credit cards. And she must have sensed I wasn't eager to accept a check from a woman who was out of Santa Teresa half the year. She was clearly well-to-do, but if a check was returned for insufficient funds, it would be a pain in the ass to track her down and make it good. 
The rich are full of surprises. Some hang on to their wealth by stiffing their creditors. Does $500 seem reasonable, she asked. Too much, I said. We're talking about a few phone calls and then a short written report. 200 would be more than enough to cover it. Unless you fail. Well, you're paying me for my time, not the results. The effort's the same regardless of the outcome. Sorry, of course. I don't expect you to work without compensation. If you wait a moment, I'll go get it. <clears throat> she got up, crossed to the sliding glass door, and went into the house. I took a sip of the Chardonnay, feeling for the first time that I could relax. She'd been clear enough about what she wanted, and while acquiring the information wasn't a slam duck, I had avenues to pursue. Moments later, she returned with a plain white envelope. She made a point of showing me a portion of the $200 bills before she slid them into the envelope and handed it to me. I put the money in my shoulder bag, pulled out a small spiral-bound notebook. I wrote her a receipt for the cash and tore off the leaf of the paper. I can type up a proper receipt at the office tomorrow. Don't worry about it, this is fine. She folded the handwritten receipt and slipped it into the file folder. A few things I should ask, I said. Oh, well, feel free. I went through a list of items I thought needed covering and she seemed happy to oblige. So that by the time we parted company, I had her home address and a mailing address in Malibu, the Malibu home phone, plus her husband's office address and two additional phone numbers for him at work. Her assistant's name was Amy. Later I realized I should have asked for Jeffrey's last name, but it hadn't occurred to me. Once in my car again, I sat in the darkened parking area while the motion activated path lights went out one by one. Using the Honda's interior light, I jotted notes on a series of index cards, which I love to do, and I carry with me as a matter of course. I don't know if she was aware that I was still on the property, but it mattered not. It's always best to capture facts when they're fresh before assumption and prejudice step in and alter memory. On the way home, I stopped at the market and stocked up on odds and ends, including paper towels, milk, bread, and peanut butter. Easter decoration accessories were set up on numerous displays, Easter egg dyeing kits, hollow plastic eggs, foil covered eggs, big foil covered chocolate bunnies, marshmallow chickens of a virulent yellow hue, bags of paper shreds resembling grass, wicker and plastic basket, baskets, as well as stuffed animals to be included in the hall. At that hour, there weren't many shoppers, and since I was the only one in line, I had a nice chat with Suzanne, the middle-aged checkout girl. I paid for my groceries with one of Hallie's $100 bills, amazed by how little change I had, that how little change I was given in return. I was home by 10, I locked up, put away the groceries, grabbed my book, and went upstairs to the loft, where I changed into the oversized t-shirt I sleep in. I brushed my teeth, washed my face, and slid under the covers. Once I found my place, I read until midnight, thinking life was well. Alrighty, that was chapter two. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, chapter three will be coming up soon. It's getting cold out here. All right, have a great day, and thanks for listening. Bye.